This morning, our scripture comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 43 through 45, and it reads, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of the city. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So today we're going to talk about Philip and Andrew and leading others to Christ. You know, during one Christmas season, a reporter in Boston saw three little girls standing in front of a store window full of toys, and one of the little girls was blind. And the reporter heard the other two little girls describing the toys to their friend. And as he listened to their description, he realized just how difficult it was to explain to someone without sight what something looks like. And that incident became the basis for a story that he wrote that week. Well, it was two weeks later, and the same reporter was attending a meeting with Dwight Moody, the evangelist and the publisher. And as the reporter questioned Moody, his hope was to catch Moody in some kind of inconsistency, something that he could use to write another interesting story. But the reporter was surprised when Moody used the story of the little girls, the story that he had written a couple of weeks before, trying to explain the toy to their blind friend to illustrate the truth. And Moody said that just as the little blind girl couldn't visualize the toys, Moody said that an unsaved person can't see Christ in all of his glory. So when we try to explain to others the goodness of Christ, sometimes we fall short. And so what Moody is saying is, Sometimes we have to take a step beyond describing the goodness of God. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to lead people to Christ. So today we're going to continue to talk about our disciples. We're going to talk about Philip and Nathaniel um, today. And in it, we'll see Philip leading Nathaniel to Christ. Philip and Nathaniel, Nathaniel is also called Bartholomew, if you're reading the scripture. They're often linked together as... Uh, companions and fellow workers in the scripture and we don't know a lot about either of them except they're both from the stadia in Galilee and the scriptures seem to suggest that Philip and Nathaniel had a desire in their hearts to know Christ and it's also believed that Philip is the disciple in Matthew the 8th chapter the 21 verse 21st and 22nd verse and he's the one who says in response to Jesus' invitation to follow him, he says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus' response, Jesus' response to that statement is, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. And what's interesting about that scripture is that Philip's father isn't yet dead. He's still alive. And what Philip is really asking Christ to do is, to be able to delay his ministry and to delay following Christ. He wants to be able to go back and care for his family until their death and then follow Christ. You know, what he's saying is, I have other priorities. I have other things in my life that's much more important than following Christ. You know, life circumstances can get in our way of following Christ. Things that we see, things that we hear get in our way. You know, when we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror, what do we see? What do we see staring back at us every morning? Do we see a child of God who is blessed to be alive and filled with the peace and the joy that only God can give because we're following Christ? Or do we see someone who has a grateful heart, who's willing to put Christ first? Or do you see someone who is so burdened and distracted by the circumstances of life that they, like Philip, have delayed following Christ? So the question is, what do you see when you look in the mirror 
in the morning. What do you see when you look around the sanctuary this morning at all of your brothers and sisters in Christ? And what do you see when you look in the faces of your family every morning? What do you see when you look out at the world through the articles that you read and the television that you watch? What do you see? Do you see what God sees or what the world tells us is most important and what should be our priority? Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, the fourth verse says that when God looks at us, he sees individuals who are precious and honored. He sees people that he loves. In Psalm 139, the 13th and the 14th verse says that he took the time to design what we looked like, who we would be, our passions and our talents. He took the time to create us individually so that we don't have the same fingerprints. When Jesus first laid his eyes on his disciples, he didn't see just the pile of rocks. He saw a cathedral. He saw a church. And so when he looked at the likes of Andrew and Simon and Philip and Nathaniel, what he saw was God-given potential. He didn't see rocks. He saw diamonds in the rough. He didn't see a bunch of uneducated fishermen. He didn't focus on what appeared to be. He saw what could be. He saw the possibilities of what they could be individually, but he also saw what they could be together. And the scripture tells us, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, that when Andrew found Jesus, the first thing Andrew did was go and find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and it says, verse 42 of that, which is John, the first chapter of John as well, it says, and he brought him to Jesus. And so we should first see the possibility in people, describe Christ to them, and then we should be prepared to take the next step when it's necessary, and that is to lead people to Christ. When we look at our scripture today, in verse 43, it says that Jesus found Philip, and Jesus said to Philip, follow me. And then Philip, just like Andrew did, went and found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, we asked ourselves at the beginning of our disciple series, what is it that we can learn from these 12 men that Christ chose? In the lives of Philip and Nathanael and also Andrew and Peter, they create a roadmap for us. What should we do when we find Jesus? First, we follow him. And second, we immediately tell others about him. A faith worth having is a faith worth sharing. That's the love of our faith, isn't it? It's easy for us to come to worship and come to Bible study. It's easy to serve the church in some way. It's easy to see people around us as a bunch of rocks instead of part of the foundation of the church. But if we can see something beautiful in those around us, then our faith becomes something that's worth sharing. You know, Satan's convinced us that we're just a bunch of rocks, not really worth that much to Christ. You know, what do we say? Ah, oh, they're dumb as a rock. And what that does is, that gives us an excuse to walk away. But if we can find the possibilities in one another, we can take the next step. Think about it this way. If we go to a new restaurant and the food and service is fantastic, our goal becomes that we have to tell people about this place. It's great, the food's great, the service is great, you know, the people is great, the atmosphere is great. We're quick to share something good. And so we'll tell people about a good restaurant or a good book. Did you see that great movie? Um, and we'll tell everybody that we meet that day that they should go and see it. You know, we, we'll go as far as writing it in the sky. Yet when it comes to sharing the greatest news in the universe, we have a tendency to keep quiet. 
Philip didn't do that. It says the first thing he did was to go and find Nathaniel and tell him. And who, so we, we ask ourselves today, who are the Nathaniels in our lives that we need to go and tell? What keeps us from leading others to Christ? Well, our first point is that, you know, it's the fact that people will be skeptical. But skepticism is not new in our faith. It's something, you know, we've learned that if something's too good to be true, then it probably isn't. That's right, you know what we've learned. That's one of the lessons that life teaches us down here. We learn to be skeptical. We learn to question. We learn to doubt. Now think about these situations because we all have some skepticism in us. If we're going to the dentist and you're sitting in his chair, what does he say? Open my eye. This isn't going to hurt a bit. <laughs> Probably isn't true. When you buy something that you have to put together, the words on the package usually say, easy to assemble. We know, we all know that that's not always true. And think back to when your kids were asking you for the pet, the new pet, right? I'll walk him, I'll feed him, I'll do everything. And you knew as you were paying for the pet and driving him home that that wasn't true, right? And the best one, hi, I'm from the IRS, I'm here to help, right? We know that's not, that's not true. So people may come to Jesus with some skepticism. That's okay. As long as they are willing to listen. We're taught to believe. We learn how to believe, even in the face of skepticism. So when Philip told Nathaniel that he had found Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel was skeptical. Nazareth, he says. Can anything good come from there? And so Philip reacted to that question perfectly because he says to Nathaniel, come and see. He issued the same invitation that Jesus issued to John's disciples, one of whom was Andrew, if you read uh, some of the scriptures in John 1. And so Philip understood Nathaniel's hesitation because Philip had some struggles of his own in believing. In John the 14th chapter, when Thomas questioned Jesus' statement that he was going away to prepare, prepare a place for him and them and us, Thomas said to, to Jesus, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered in one of my favorite scriptures, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he goes on to say, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. And this is what Philip, said, Philip says to him. Philip's been with Jesus through all the miracles and uh, things that he's done and the teachings. And Philip says to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the father. And that will be enough for us. What does Philip mean, show us the father? And Jesus answered him. He says, don't you know, Philip, even after I've been with you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? So Philip, with that question, reveals the struggle that he has reconciling the humanism of Jesus, right, with the deity of Jesus. And sometimes we have that struggle as well. We have, we, we're skeptical about whether or not God was willing to do the thing, the very thing that we ask him to do. And so if we struggle sometimes, and we are believers, certainly those who are unsaved, those that we meet, sometimes will struggle with the gospel that we share. They'll struggle when we tell them that, you know, the scripture says in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 15th chapter, the fourth chapter, the 15th verse, that we have a high priest who sympathizes and understands our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, everything that we've experienced on this earth. If you read the Bible, Jesus experienced as well. The only difference is that he didn't sin. He didn't give in to temptation where we at times give 
into temptation. When we describe that as our Savior, sometimes people are skeptical. But Jesus was a carpenter, a working man in Nazareth. He understands what it's like to have to work for a living. He knows the difficulty of making ends meet. He knows what it's like to grow up with, in a family that doesn't have a lot. He knows the difficulty of living in an ordinary home with a big family. He knows what it's like to be tempted. And the life of Jesus shows us the struggle in this life, but he also shows us how to overcome it. And he shows us a God who goes through the same struggle that we go through. So Jesus says to Philip in John 14, 11, the verse, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe the evidence in what you see. Believe what you see, and he says, follow me, and he says, come and see. And so that's our answer to people when we're leading them to Christ, and they express skepticism and unbelief. All we have to do is say, Come and see. Philip didn't argue with Nathaniel. We don't have to argue or try to convince people into the faith. Um, we don't have to bully them into the faith. We don't have to shame them into the faith or even scare them into the faith, right? The only way we can convince people of the supremacy of Christ is to confront them with Christ, to present to them the story of the cross. It's not some clever argument that we have to put together to bring people along. It's simply the presentation of who Christ is and an invitation to people to come and see. And so the next point is, if we extend that invitation, Christ will do the rest. He'll take care of the rest. Come and see. No arm twisting, no gimmicks, no body thumping, no pressure, just a simple forthright invitation Come and spend time with Jesus and with those he's calling to join him in living and proclaiming a new life. Come and see. Come and see with eyes of faith and allow yourself to be transformed. You know, Mark Borg says in his book, and it's entitled Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, he says, believing in Jesus is movement from secondhand religion to firsthand religion. We all know what secondhand religion is. Somebody else told us about. But because you're all sitting in this seat, your seats today, you've moved from secondhand religion to firsthand religion. From having heard about Jesus to being in a relationship with Jesus. And that's what happened to Philip and Nathaniel. All their lives, they heard about Christ. They've been reading about it. They waited for Christ. Now, all of a sudden, here he is, present and in the flesh. You know, Philip, and you know, the more they were with Jesus, the more they learned about Jesus. You know, Philip saw a different um, uh, side of Christ when he was feeding the 5,000 in John, the sixth chapter. It says that Jesus had crossed over to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he said that a group of people were following him because he had healed the sick. And so, Jesus said the disciples go up to the mountainside and they sit down because it's, it's almost a Jewish Passover. And it says Jesus looks up and he sees this big crowd of people coming toward him and he says to Philip, he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And Peter's answer, Philip, I'm sorry, Philip's answer in verse 7 is, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have enough. Philip did what we would have done, or he did what I would have done. His first thought was to count the cost. How much is it going to cost us to feed all these people? And I find it interesting that sometimes we first count the cost, but we serve a God of all the riches in glory. Everything we have, everything we see, he created. He's the ruler over absolutely everything. But the first thing that we say is how much will it cost us? And you had an answer. He says, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. 
And Jesus says to him, have the people sit down. And the scripture says that he took the loaves and he blessed them and he distributed it to the people who were seated and as much as they wanted and they still had scraps left over that they took up. It's the first hand encounter that we have with God. It's seeing for ourselves. It's trusting the words spoken uh, by God to Jesus at the time of Jesus' baptism that also applies to us, right? What did God say about Jesus when John the Baptist baptized him? He said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He issues that same phrase about each of us. We are his beloved son or daughter in whom he is well pleased. And once we're anchored in that kind of love, we are able to find the strength and the power to walk in the steps of Jesus and go the extra miles in our relationships and in witnessing for peace and extending our arms in reconciliation and offering acts of compassion and care and serving those in need without ever asking, what is it going to cost me? Because if God asked us to do it, if Christ asked us to do it, then that means that he is going to provide. So Philip issues this invitation to Nathaniel, come and see. Nathaniel takes Philip up on the invitation. And so when Jesus sees Nathaniel coming, he says of him in verse 47, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And what is he saying? He's saying, here comes Philip, without an agenda, without any ulterior motive, He's just coming to see what Jesus is about. And notice what happens. You know, once uh, Philip issues the invitation, now it's no longer a conversation between Philip and Nathaniel about Christ. It's literally a conversation between Nathaniel and God because he steps in and he does the rest. And Nathaniel asks Jesus a question. He says, how do you, how do you know me, right? And Jesus says to him, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And so Jesus speaks to the things that Nathaniel thinks of when he's all alone. Because sitting under that tree, he's in a place of meditation. And he's in a place of thought. And he's pondering those things in his heart that he hasn't shared with people before. And so Jesus is speaking to the personal things in our hearts. Have you ever been in a place where you've asked God for something, not asked anybody else, but asked God for something, and have him respond in a way that you know it couldn't be anybody but him because you hadn't shared uh, your desires with anyone else. And so the good thing about Jesus is, you know, he doesn't have any pre preconceived notions about Nathaniel, other than the fact that he's part of the church that he's building. And that's our direction, to come to others without any preconceived notions other than the fact that God loves us all and that he desires that we all be saved. Because when we have preconceived um, descriptions or notions about other people, we limit our potential, not their potential, but we limit our potential to extend Christ to them, right? Because we put up boundaries about our ability to relate to them and their ability to relate to us. If we can just come with no deceit, with no ulterior motive, with no preconceived uh, notion, that's what we seek in the people sitting around us. We just point them in the right direction and allow Christ to do the work. The work. Nathaniel had faith, but more importantly, he had this great potential that Christ saw in him. There's a phrase that millennials and Gen Z uses a lot. You may have heard them say it. They say, I see you. Right? Sometimes you hear them, they'll be talking about something and they'll say, I see you. And what they mean is, I understand you. I understand what you're saying. I understand how you feel without you even completing your description. I recognize you as a person. I recognize your struggle. I understand who you are. I understand where you are. And 
And that's what Jesus does to Nathaniel in the scripture. And the same thing that he does to Nathaniel in the scripture, he does to us. He sees us. He literally sees us. Psalm 139 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me, ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. And because Nathaniel knew that Jesus really got him and really saw him, he says in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, and you are the King of Israel. And Jesus says to him in verse 50, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see greater things again. And so Jesus is saying to him, there's more. There's so much more than what you're experiencing right now in this moment. And that's the story. There's so much more in Christ than we can ever conceive of. We come to worship with great expectations. We come with glows on our faces and enthusiasm in our voices and a gleam in our eyes because we have discovered Jesus. And what he's asking us today is share what we've discovered with someone else. There's a story, I'll close with this, of a little boy named Josh. And Josh wouldn't eat anything mixed together. He didn't even want his food to touch on the plate. We know some people like that, right? He didn't even want his food to touch on the plate. And his parents told him, they said, well, you know, your food gets mixed up in your stomach, so it's not really a big deal anyway. And, but Josh didn't believe him. And they tried everything they could to get him to try casseroles and stews and different things that were mixed together, but he wouldn't do it. And then one night when Josh was 11, there was a commercial on TV. And it was Kraft Macaroni and Cheese commercial. And they were promoting this new line of canned tomatoes. And they shared this simple recipe. They said it's one pound, one pound of hamburger, a can of Mexican-style tomatoes, and a family-sized Kraft macaroni and cheese. And Josh was listening to that, and he said, that sounds pretty good. Well, guess what they had for dinner that night? It was Josh's breakthrough meal. It was his first meal eating foods mixed together. He had to experience it for himself. Like Nathaniel, Nathaniel, he had to come and see. And that's the invitation that we're called to give to everyone. Come and see. That's the essence of evangelism. That's what Jesus meant when he says, Go ye therefore unto all the nations, sharing all that I have shared with you. Right? That's what he meant. Come and see. Come and see what's going on in our church. Come and see what's going on at Soresco. Come and see the singing and the Sunday school and the youth. And come and see for yourself how much fun this Christian fellowship can be. Come and see just what our Savior can do in your life. Come and see. No threat of judgment. No threat of being wrestled to the ground and forced fed what we believe. No threat at all, just a simple invitation. Come and see for yourself. Experience it firsthand. And that's how we lead people to Christ. We don't have to address the skepticism. People are always skeptics. We've been taught to be skeptics. But all we have to do is extend the invitation and leave the rest. Amen? Amen. Amen. If there's anyone here today who hasn't accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, here's a simple invitation. He was born for our benefit. He died on the cross for our benefit so that we could spend a life in eternity. And the gift that he gives us that no matter what happens today, if we saved, if we're saved, we know where we end up. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's just a step from here on earth into eternity. So if there's anyone here today 
who hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now is the time. He makes it as simple as possible. All we have to do is ask him to forgive us of our sin, come into our lives, and be the Lord of our lives. There's no one to know. 